Hello, everyone. I am Robin Awind, the Cultural Arts Director for the Sabus and St. Paul JCCs. It's so great to have you all here with us today. Welcome to today's event. You need to be ready to let go of what the eye sees. This special event is part of the virtual Twin Cities Jewish Film Festival and co-presented by TC Jew Folk and JCreate. JCreate is a new online community administered by Jew Folk for Jewish artists, craftspeople, and creatives in Minnesota. Professionals, semi-pros, and hobbyists are all welcome. We are so grateful to have you all here joining us from near and far. We have an exciting hour plus ahead. First, we will see the short 16 minute film. You need to be ready to let go of what the eye sees. Then we will hear from four esteemed panelists, Ari Tepperberg, Noam Baram Ben Yosef, Dr. Noam Siena, and Dr. Sheer Alone moderated by Dr. Katia Oisherman. Katia is an artist, educator, and textile researcher. Currently, she is a visiting researcher at the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Minnesota and a continuing education lecturer at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. We will conclude the event with a short Q&A. Thank you to our community partners for helping to make this event possible. The Israel Museum, the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Minnesota, the Israel Center of the Minneapolis Jewish Federation, and the St. Paul Jewish Federation. Before we begin the film, I just want to let you know that we will put the Vimeo link to the film in the chat box in the event that anyone runs into technical issues during the film. Thank you again for being here and please enjoy the film. צריך להיות מוכן להרפות ממה שהעין רואה. כשהתחלתי לחזור בתשובה, עבדתי בקניון. אני לא אשכח את זה שפתאום הסתכלתי מסביב ואני רואה את כל הבובות רעבה ואני רואה את כל הרדיפה הזאת אחרי משקל ואחרי היקפים ואחרי הגדרות ואמרתי לעצמי, השם תרחם, כאילו... להגדיר אישה לפי גובה משקל והיקפים זה פשוט שנאה. זה אכזריות. אני, אני חיפשתי את הגבול שלי. איפה אני מתחילה? איפה אני נגמרת? מה אני באמת רוצה? נמאס לי לתת לגוף לנהל אותי. גדלתי בבית חילוני, במושב בצפון, אבל תמיד היו לי שאלות לגבי העולם שהטרידו אותי. בתור ילדה הייתי מדברת עם השם, הייתי מתפללת לפני השינה ומברכת אותו, ו... היה לי הסכם פנימי ש... <laughs> שאם אני אתאמן חזק והרבה, אני אצליח לעוף לשמיים ו... ולהתחבר עם השם. <laughs> הוא ילמד אותי לעוף. התחלתי לחזור בתשובה אחרי הצבא, אחרי זה למדתי ביולוגיה ומחשבים באוניברסיטה העברית בירושלים, והייתי מדברת עם השם המון, אבל בשלב כלשהו, כאילו הרגשתי שהוא אומר לי, אני נתתי לך את עצמי, אבל עכשיו את תתני לי אותך. כפשוטו. היה לי הכל, אבל, אבל בעצם הרגשתי ש... שאין לי כלום. It took a real earthquake to make me turn into a nun. It's never one thing, always a combination of things that happen and change the whole way you look at life. It's not something you choose. It's God's will. Until I was 22, I lived a very adventurous life, very free. I lived in Warsaw and I was a DJ for three years. Then I decided to study medicine, so I moved to the States to study at Berkeley. 
One day when I was riding my motorcycle, I heard a voice inside me saying, you have everything, but why aren't you happy? That evening when I went home, I don't know why, but I stood for a long moment at the doorway and that's what saved my life because at that specific moment, a huge earthquake happened. The house went off its foundation and I looked down at the marina and saw a big pillar of flame and smoke. That was the point where the change started. كان لحلم اللي عاد على نفسه قبل ما لبست هيك اللي في النبي محمد عليه السلام أعطاني سبع أسهم رحت لعند الشيخ بالحرم الشريف عشان يفسر لي الحلم قال لي أنت لازم تلتزمي بنفس اليوم لبست الحجاب لكن رجع الحلم كمان دور رحت عند الشيخ وهو رجع على حكيه بس ما فهمت شو لازم أعمل لحد ما أمي الله يرحمها توفت كنت مكسورة حسيت إنه ما في معنى للحياة بيوم رحت على المسجد الأقصى وفجأة وقفت إقبالي مرة اللي أنا ما بعرفها مدت إيدها وأعطتني كيس قالت لي هذا إلك قالت لي إنها إجت للحرم الشريف وبقصدها تعطي النقاب لأول مرة بتشوفها وأنا كنت أول مرة شفتها أشعر بدني حسيت إنه أعطتني مكتوب من الله سبحانه وتعالى بنفس اليوم بطلت أحلم الحلم أخي خشوف شلو يبقشوا مبتيم كل عينيان شي التسنيوت زي لكرب التجيولة ככל שהאישה שומרת על צניעותה ונזהרת שלא יסתכלו בגברים חוץ מבעלה, היא מצילה אותם, שהיא לא מחטיאה אותם להסתכל עליה. כמו שנאמר, כשתראה את כל האנשים מכוסות מכף רגל ועד ראש, זה סימן שהמשיח בפתח. השל הראשון שלי היה פרחוני, וכשלבשתי אותו פעם ראשונה, הרגשתי כמו קלה מתחת לחופה. היה לי אור גדול, אפילו הייתי הולכת לישון עם השל. אפילו הילדים שלי אמרו, אמא, את נראית ממש כמו מלכה. <laughs> הבנות גם רצו להתלבש ככה. אחר כך, עם הזמן, לאט לאט השל התארך ונהיה כ... ואני הרגשתי כאילו הקדוש ברוך הוא הולך איתי, כאילו עוטף אותי באהבה שלו, ושהשכינה עוטפת אותי. הרגשתי, ועד היום אני עדיין מרגישה כמו משמר כבוד שמלווה אותי. My friend took me to meet his spiritual father, and after meeting him a few times, I decided to leave everything and go back home to Poland. I took all my clothes, mini skirts, shorts, tights, and gave them to a good friend. Later, she gave them on herself because she also became a nun. My mother had a very hard time with it. If there is one thing I regret, is that I didn't give her enough time. My father said, I don't know what it means to be a nun, but if you are happy, I'm happy. I've been wearing black for 19 years now, so I feel like it's my skin. If I need to take it off, I feel like I have no skin. In the first time I was wearing a dress, I felt like I was wearing a dress. It was very difficult. I was wearing a dress, I was not able to breathe. I didn't have a dress. لما طلعت من المسجد حسيت إنه إشي فتح لي قلبي كل الهوى والنفس رجعوا حسيت نشوي حسيت إنه سبحانه وتعالى اختارني من بين مليون وحدة متاخت لغالة أني, أني خفشيها يتر مكل إشا كل كفودة بتملخ بنيمة إما أني أفخر لأخنيس أدخل لكان أز تكنس أبل لما أني أدخل لأوت شل كولام היום אני קשורה ברעלה. ממש קשה לי שיראו אותי. The habit is black because it's like we are dead to the world. Everything we do, we devote to God. This is why we have this specific appearance. This is why we keep ourselves at a distance from the world. It's like we were a flag. When you see a soldier, you understand that he has a mission. Jouati... دايما كنت بدي البس نقاب دايما كنت اطلع على مرت عمي اللي كانت مع نقاب 
واستنيت اللحظة اللي أقدر أتنقب فيها كل إشي كان عندي ومع هاد حسيت إنه في إشي ناقصني بالمرات الأولى اللي لبست فيها النقاب كتير تأثرت بس خفت كمان خفت إنه حياتي خلصت شو مش رح أطلع على مطاعم مش مش رح أسافر لبرا مش رح أنبسط وأروح مشاوير قال لي أبوي فكري منيح منيح بالموضوع لأنه إذا بتلبسي وبعدين تشلحي هذا الذنب لا يغتفر عليه أختي طلعت علي وبدت تبكي أنا بعرف شو يفكرت داخلها شو بدهن يقولوا الجيران In my first year in Jerusalem I went to Masharim once and a small boy came and spat on my feet I tried to smile but inside me I felt so humiliated. I came home and I started to cry. But then I understood that I cannot blame this boy. I cannot judge him. Maybe I could have been raised in a Jewish family or a Muslim family. And then for sure I would have different beliefs. Faith is a need of the soul. Still, when I want to leave the old city, I make sure that my cross is visible. Once a soldier stopped me because he thought I'm a Muslim. أنا ما بحس صعوبي، كل إشي بتحبيه بصير هوين، واللي بتحبيهوش بصير صعب. مرة سألني جندي بالحاجز، مش شوباني؟ قلت له أكيد حم، وأنتِ مش شوبان؟ صار يضحك، وقال لي مزبوط، أنا كمان شوبان. ما لو أمرين لي إيخس مخشفة ملأخة مافت جاي لختة شزي نزيرة إيش كالش كورم لي عربية أم شوخخيم شأسفتا أو أيما شأسفتا شلهم ألخا كخا. Every problem in the world comes from wrong religious ways of living. This is what causes all the problems in history. I can't take the role of God. اليوم بعملوني باحترام. قبل كانوا يعكسوني ويسافروا لي. ويزدتوا لي كلمات زي شو هالأفة من الصدر بس من لما لبست أنا محمية ومسطورة أني لا يخلى لتأغ لكم لأيزي بزيونات زي يخلى أجيع أني سفقت كلالات ويريكات وميلين قصات زي ممش لأكد على مزباخ خردين خلونين مش أتم رتسيم زي كمو رأي أنشي مجيبين لفي أبنيميوت شلهم כמה פעמים שאלתי את עצמי, מה אני צריכה את זה? אבל אני מרגישה שלשם ככה הגעתי לעולם הזה. זה התיקון של הנשמה שלי, כפשוטו. עצם זה שרואים אותי, אני עצם בגרון. מרה ספרת מעסח במונקה בלי מחדר אפי נאבלס. עושלנו על חאג'ז וכאנו הונג ג'ונדיין. עלו לנו נרפע על ניקב. סחיבתי חפת, והיא רפעת על ניקב טוואלי. וקטה ג'ונדי בתווג'ה לי, בואו לי יאללה ארפע כמן אינטי ניקב. رفعت الهاند بريكس طلعت من السيارة قلت له إيش بدك صاحبتي هبلة بس أنا لا تفضل هاي الهوية طلع هون وطلع هون على نفس العينين نفس الشي مزبوط فيلا ما ناتو خلص مرقنا أنا عايشي في هذا العالم لأجل ديني على أرضنا إحنا مش قادرين ندافع على وطننا مش قادرين شو بقي حافظ على شرفنا على ديننا على مبادئنا أنا هون أنا موجودي وإنتو ما راح تقدروا تخفوني You know, we are all human beings We have weaknesses In my monastery, we are about 20 sisters So we always have conflicts Most sisters cover their hair also when they sleep But I usually sleep without the cover Does it make me less sister than the others? Of course not That's why it's very important to live in a convent It's like in the sea The waves make all the stones smooth. That is what the convent does, teaches us to give room to the other. جمال المرأة كله بوجهها. هذا مش مكتوب بالقرآن بس السنة بتقول إنه نساء الرسول عليه السلام غطوا كل جسمهن كمان مع نقاب. لإمرأة فتني. وعلشان هيك عندي مسؤولية أغطي نفسي. والرجل عليه مسؤولية إنه ما يتطلع. مهم إنك تغطي وجهك. ممنوع يشوفوا الحواجب وكمان مكياج ممنوع بس العينين الإشي بتعلق بطعم الوحدة وبتعلق كمان بالفصل ولوين طالعة في كتير أنواع وألوان أهم إشي إني أكون جميلة بعينين زوجي بالبيت كل شي مسموح 
ما بيطلع لبرا وبيشوف نساء حلوات ولما بيرجع على البيت مهم انه تكون عنده مرة حلوة زي اللي قلو أب قلب صدفة أخي خشوف لتشتش את קווי הגוף שלא יראו את צורת הגוף או בכלל את התנועה שלו כדי לא לעורר חס ושלום ערעורי עבירה. In every religion if you don't focus on the meaning you don't know why you do it. It's like in art. Faith has the ability to change the material. To give life to a material that has no life. זה בידוד בתוך בידוד בתוך בידוד בתוך בידוד. לא מספיק שאת בתור בעלת תשובה כבר איבדת את המשפחה, את החברה, את העבר שלך, איבדת גם חלק משמעותי ממך, אז את גם הולכת עם לבוש שהוא כל כך שנוא על כולם. אבל אני יודעת בראש שזאת האמת לאמיתה. זה פשוט אוהל. האוהל של שרה. אז אני הולכת עם האוהל שלי עליי. You start as a trudnica. You still wear your regular clothes and you test yourself to see if you can do it. It's like a preparation stage. When you decide that you want to do it and that you can do it, you become a poslushnica. You become a sister only when you have your first kura ceremony, in which you receive the raso, the outer cloak that covers your hands and makes you seem like an angel. The last stage is the final kura, in which you wear a white gown, which is like being naked. The bishop cuts your hair in four places in a shape of a cross and gives you a new name. He throws the scissors three times and you give it back to him each time to make sure that you really chose this path. In this ceremony, you get the mantia, the powerful armoring cloak. and the nomitka, which is like the bridal crown and veil. After this vow, there is no going back. It feels like your spirit was elevated and it's very hard to find your balance. The first year is like a honeymoon, but after it, there are huge battles inside your soul. بقدرش أفسر قديش مريح إني أوقف بين إيدين الله عز وجل وأصلي أنا بوقف وبصلي صلاتي واللي جنبي واقفي وبتصلي صلاتها وكل واحدة منا عند العلاقة تبعتها مع الخالق Hello friends, and thank you for joining us today. The film that we have just seen was created especially for the exhibition Veiled Woman of the Holy Land, New Trends in Modest Dress, that opened in 2019 in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. 
the exhibition was the result of the research and field work carried out by the curator Noam Baram Ben Yosef and explored the current similarities and differences between radical modesty dress among peers, Jewish, Muslim, Druze, and Christian women in Israel. Unveiling veiled woman is an intensely paradoxical act. Mm -hmm. The difficulty in photographing mm -hmm. or recording such woman mm -hmm. led to inviting Ari Tepperberg, an interdisciplinary artist whose background is in visual theater to create in collaboration with the exhibition curator an experimental ethnographic display using actresses who play the roles of the veiled woman. Their spoken text are based on long-term fieldwork among the women from the three different religions. The exhibition combined an installation with three short video artworks and the display of 14 outfits of clothing. So this is the background of our discussion today. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests. Noam Baram Ben Yosef is the senior curator of ethnography emeritus in the Jewish art and life wing of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Noam worked in the museum for 43 years. Among the exhibition that she curated are Bethlehem Embroidery, 1987, Dress and Embroidery Among Arab and Druze in Eretz Israel in 1989, Brides and Betrothal, Jewish Wedding Ritual in Afghanistan in 1996, Bread Daily and Divine in 2006, and many others. Ari Tepperberg is an interdisciplinary artist performer, opera director, and maker of stage works. He was the artistic consultant consultant to the Veiled Woman of the Holy Land exhibition and creator of the video art. You need to be ready to let go of what the eye sees in collaboration with Noam Baram Ben Yosef. Our panelists are Dr. Noam Siena, who teaches, his, who teaches history and Middle Eastern studies at the University of St. Thomas. He received his PhD in Jewish history from the University of Minnesota in 2020. Congratulations, uh, Noam. Uh, Dr. Shir Alon is the Assistant Professor of Modern, Middle, uh, of Modern Middle Eastern Cultures at the University of Minnesota in Twin Cities. And I am Katya Oishman, and I'm very proud uh, to be able to moderate this discussion. So we will begin with short introductions of the project by Noam and Ari, and then we will move to the discussion with our panelists. The last 15 minutes we will dedicate to the questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please type it using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and I will read the questions to the panel after we conclude the formal discussion. So I would like to start with Noam. So can you please tell us a little bit about the exhibition? Okay, the exhibition Veiled Women uh, of the Holy Land. And um, it's a catalog that appeared also in Hebrew and Arabic, is a result of an ongoing field work uh, reflecting relatively new uh, social phenomena in Israel among women from the three monotheistic religions. In one of my excursions uh, among the ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem around 2010, uh, I went down from the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish neighborhood towards Damascus Gate uh, and the Muslim quarter in the old city. There is a very special uh, point of observation there, uh, where you can uh, watch the people passing by. And then I, suddenly I realized that uh, from afar, or even behind, let's say, uh, I can't tell who is who. Is she Muslim? Is she Jewish? Is she a Christian Orthodox nun? Um, the similarity was so striking uh, that uh, 
it made me very curious to know and to learn about the special meaning given to each um, garment by those uh, pious women. And I wondered if the women themselves um, were aware of this uh, similarity. Uh, as to me, it seemed uh, to be a lively inner conversation. So let's see um, uh, slide number two and number, slide number two. Are we able to see it? No. Not yet. The second one, please. Yeah. Those are the Russian Orthodox nun. And uh, please, uh, the next one, number three. Those are the Muslim women in uh, Haram al-Sharif in the old city near Al-Aqsa during the Ramadan. And uh, the next one, please. This is a girl, Jewish girl. Um, and I think you can see the similarities as well. Uh, the veiled uh, Jewish uh, woman phenomena broke into the Israeli public consciousness by the end of 2007. These women, mostly newly uh, observant, uh, who chose to cover themselves from head to toe, uh, pushed the issue of modesty uh, to the extreme as an act for, of uh, redemption uh, for themselves and for the whole people of uh, Israel. I could, not, I could notice the same tendency occurred among the Muslim pious women towards 2010. And uh, the new religious dress, please show the next uh, slide. Uh, the next, this is a Jewish woman, but the next, yeah, this is the, uh, the new religious uh, dress that is widespread all over the world. And the next, please. The next, yeah. So um, in uh, towards 2010, parallel to what, what's going in the Jewish part, uh, the ultra Orthodox and the extreme uh, veiled women, new religious uh, uh, dress, um, uh, uh, we see uh, that the veil, the veils were added and uh, uh, praying suit um, were introduced um, to our uh, region. And uh, the Christian nuns uh, especially the Orthodox, always wore their black uniforms. So please, can we see the next one? Okay. Um, after accumulating a huge quantity of visual and theoretical material, as well as religious law literature, I started to interview the women themselves. Many of the women I approached were reluctant to give interviews to a museum representative. Uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, the public opinion at that time uh, was quite uh, hostile towards uh, Jew Jewish women and 
Muslim women as well. These interviews were emotionally intensive for me. Uh, and I felt already then that their voice must be heard in the exhibition and in the catalog as well. Uh, translating this uh, political, social, and spiritual ideas into uh, a static uh, clothing exhibition uh, seemed lacking. Uh, so in order to solve this, I approach Ari Tepperberg, a, a multidisciplinary artist, uh, which conceived the video piece and became our artistic consultant, together with uh, Rona Czernica, our exhibition designer. Um, we had uh, to take a, a very tearing off decision. Uh, all the powerful images that the, the photographers took in the street and the theoretical material will be in the catalog while the exhibition will be a performative uh, experience. And the result was, please, the next, uh, the next slide, yeah. Uh, the result was a walk in a virtual street divided by meshes uh, that represent our gaze uh, through a veil. Um, and uh, I believe that everyone uh, has a kind of veil on, on his eyes. Uh, and through this veil, we put tags on people, especially by the way they dress. And we wanted the people uh, to be able to lift this veil even for a moment even for a second. And uh, um, the visitors, when they come, they see those women from behind, like I saw them um, on the way from the ultra-Orthodox uh, neighborhood uh, to the old city. And uh, as they pass this street, uh, they pass through separate stages, displaying the veiled dresses of each group. The exhibition hall echoes the sounds coming from the video art uh, and invite the visitor to the final hall where the video is shown on three screens. The next and final slide, please. And now Ari can tell you more about the video. Uh, Katya, we couldn't hear you, but I guess... Yes, yes, Ari, please, please do continue and tell us a little uh -huh. bit about your perspective on, the, on this project. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, hi, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us and for having this talk together. Um, so yes, as Nam said, I joined the project um, when there wasn't a video uh, in the planning. Like uh, I just joined because uh, Nam had this huge, uh, vast research um, that, that she was looking how to give form to. And uh, it was clear that it shouldn't be like an old school ethnography exhibition, but rather something a bit more performative or more installation um, oriented. Uh, so, so in our conversations about how, how to turn uh, these materials into form and space and experience, um, we thought, or I thought, I don't know, uh, like about the, the idea to make a film and in the beginning we thought of doing three separate films uh, we imagined the space to be this one big street as uh, nam uh, called it also and and the visitor to have booths on the way where they can enter and meet one of these women and eventually in this 
a triangle of, of uh, collaboration between Noam, myself, and uh, Rona Chernika, the, the designer, we found that the best solution would be to to have it all be the like the last stage of, of, of your path and the video to be one work that is uh, orchestrated or like, uh, you know, combined with these three women. And of course, now it seems like, how could it have been <laughs> different? And so, uh, right, it feels. Um, so uh, we started collecting texts from Nam's interviews. And in fact, what we did was to write a monologue for each character that was made out, out of four to five different uh, real women. So this is important to say each of these monologues are, are each of these words was said by one of these women in reality, but we uh, joined them together into one probable identity that we felt was representing of, of the women that Noam met. Uh, I'm saying Noam because, uh, you know, most of them wouldn't meet me as a man uh, or, or if they would, then not in, in this very uh, exposed way. Uh, so that's also like an interesting uh, beginning point of the, of the complexity of this action that we did. Um, and then, so we, we wrote these monologues and um, yeah, so each of them is made out of four to five different characters and we decided to have actresses portray these women also as, as a kind of distancing element, like an artistic uh, go-between uh, that is not, you know, fully documentary or even sometimes voyeuristic or populistic. We wanted it to stay with a certain distancing that allows you to really listen, maybe ponder and, um, you know, not um, have all the, all, what, like Noam said, all the veils that we carry with us that we tend to apply on, on the people that we see, especially if it's such a, uh, an intense subject that people have a lot, uh, a lot of opinion about. Um, yeah, so, so, and of course, as, as Nam said, I was also the artistic consultant to the whole exhibition. So it was very interwoven working on the film and working on the space and working on everything and on, on the mannequins. It was all like one, one, uh, project. Thank you very much, uh, Ari and Noam. So uh, can we maybe listen to the questions from Shir? Um, yeah, Hi. I'm, I'm going to ask um, one question and open it up for discussion, or should I just uh, give out all of them? Uh, maybe one. let's uh, let's one at start. A time, I think. Yeah, yeah. Let's start yeah. with okay. one at a time and see where we where mm -hmm. we get. To. Yeah, that's what I that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. So um, first, um, thank you everyone for for coming and um, Katya for putting the event together, and Noam and Ari for this um, beautiful um, film that you made that raises so many fascinating and uneasy questions, and. Um, the, there is so much to talk about, I think, in terms of um, the um, different meanings that um, pious women um, attribute to this mode of dress within different um, systems of value. But I actually wanted my first question to be about um, the film and some of the aesthetic choices in the film, just to make sure we um, touch upon that. And for me, it was very clear that this film is grounded in an in a very um, present tension between the voiceover and the footage, right? So on the one hand, we have the voiceover um, where we hear the um, actresses, characters talk about how meaningful and empowering um, they find veiling to be um, and the different value systems in which they um, see this um, action of being, or this fact of being visibly invisible, as they say. Um, and even, you know, theologically, it's something that brings us closer to salvation. 
Um, and yet in the film itself, we see the actresses uncover their face and they make eye contact with us. Um, they take off their clothes um, and show us their, their garments, which is, you know, this physicality is a big part of this the film, the materiality of the clothes. And I'm, I'm sure this tension was apparent to you as you were making the film. Um, so I wonder how you approach this and why you, you decided that the exhibition needed a video of unveiling in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, uh, as you say, it's a very, it's a very big uh, subject, was a very big subject. And I think what I didn't mention before, and it's very relevant for, for this question is that in fact, one of the one of the um, ideas that even brought to life the, the decision to make a film was that we wanted to show Noam wanted to show the layers of dress under the cover because when we see these women, we miss so much of the um, ethnographic information and, and richness, and also when we see they're outside we see the place where they become similar because as they go farther in their uh, modesty they become almost similar but on the other hand when you go down and you see the layers that's where they differ that's where they uh, even um, uh, manifest their identity and their also decision because sometimes they can choose how many layers to wear and which exactly which color some decide to stop somewhere some decide, you know there there's a lot of detail there so we, and we had thoughts that that there will be a room that will be like a closet with everything spread and and we decided that that no that that's not the right thing and and then it also uh connected to the idea of of this unraveling that is on the one hand very uh, matter of fact they are taking layers off but it's also sort of an image or like a um, an emotional identity action they are unfolding and unraveling their story their their characters their decisions their history um and 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 that was quite clear at the very beginning but but then the challenge was how to not make it be provocative because uh, because it could have been and uh, and some of, of the actually just the Jewish <laughs> women that were interviewed found found it to be too provocative uh, but 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 the others and like the, the most part of the the women that were interviewed for the for the exhibition found it very respectful and uh, and also uh, accurate uh, they, they saw themselves there uh, so, so yeah, we wanted to expose, we wanted to show everything and then all the images that come out of it of the unraveling and also like wearing your, your armor, your, your, yeah, your uh, uh, uniform. Uh, Norm, would you like to add anything to, uh, to Ari's response? You're mute, Nam. Yes, I wanted to tell uh, an anecdote uh, from the time that we we spent together. Um, uh, actually, I went with the actresses uh, to the women themselves. Uh, they they talked with them. They learned how to, to get dressed. And they learned the, the, the very special choreography, even I would say, uh, of, uh, of using those covers. Because, you know, it, it looks like just simple clothes, but uh, it, it depends what you do with it. It depends how you move with it. Uh, so for me, the women, uh, in the street, uh, look sometimes as uh, as they are moving statues. Uh, the, there's something aesthetic about them. Even um, even you feel very uh, sometimes horrified even. But um, so the actresses went uh, to the women, and then 
uh, one day I went with Ari uh, to one of my uh, beloved uh, interviewees, Jewish one, um, and uh, she didn't accept him to enter to her house. Um, he had to sit uh, in the veranda and she gave him the watermelon through the window. And, um, and uh, then she, she started to interview me, uh, what we are going to do? What is it exactly our exhibition? So uh, I told her, okay, we are making a film. We are using uh, three actresses and um, so she, so she, she asked me, uh, could you give me the phone number of one of the the Jewish uh, actress? And I said, okay, uh, take. And um, um, uh, afterwards, I felt it was a mistake because she really called uh, Neta uh, Spiegelman and spoke with her and interviewed her and Neta told her, yes, I'm, uh, I'm getting dressed and also I'm un unveil myself. So she was really horrified. And then she told me, listen, for you maybe if you go with our uh, soul uh, um, underdress, uh, in Wiesengof, in, in the main street of Tel Aviv, it's really wonderful. But for us, it's a blasphemy. You shouldn't do it. It's a, it's a, it's a big sin. And um, it took me a lot of time to learn that ultra-Orthodox expressing themselves in, in many very, very strong expressions, like, um, I don't know exactly how to translate it, but Masirut uh, Nefesh and Kiddush Hashem and Chilul Hashem and all this, uh, it goes like this without, uh, without any problem to use it. And uh, I, came, I came back to Ari and, and told him and I said, wow, I was so stupid what I did. And, and it was really a crisis. And, um, uh, and then afterwards we calmed down and uh, we said, okay, we continue. Uh, it's okay. And by the end, it was very okay. Nobody was um, offended. Um, maybe one Muslim uh, woman felt offended that, uh, that the, the actress uh, take off uh, her clothing. It's, it's such a careful balancing act. It's really <laughs> admirable how you pulled it all together. All right. So thank you very much for those fascinating insights. Uh, Noam Siena, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes, I, I want to echo uh, Shil, uh, you know, to say what an amazing, uh, thoughtful and insightful and, and, and challenging uh, uh, film and also exhibition. I'm, I'm uh, sorry I, I didn't get to see the exhibition, although I was talking to my parents and they actually told me that they went to the exhibition, they saw it in Jerusalem and they, they found it very, very uh, thought provoking. And, and so I, Thank I said, you. Oh. yeah, so they, um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, a lot of our conversation has been about emphasizing and highlighting the similarity and even you know, I'm sort of located the beginning of the exhibition in this moment of noticing similarity between these uh, women. Uh, and, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the differences that come out or that came out in the interviews and the, the in-depth relationships that you built. I'm sure that one of the things that came out was the, the distinctiveness, both of each individual woman and her choices 
to wear this or that. And mm -hmm. also the groups, you know, that there are, for example, we, we, we mm -hmm. saw even in the film, the nun, her clothing is mandated by a traditional set of garments which each have their own name that have you know this one has a cross on it and this one has a little inscription on it and um whereas the jewish women it seems like are creating more based on their own choices they're they're creating an aesthetic mm -hmm. um that, that doesn't have that external structure so i'm wondering if you could speak about how you noticed and and recognized the differences between these groups in your work mm -hmm. Okay, uh, from the very beginning, it was clear to me that the comparison is not balanced. Uh, um, the Jewish modesty women and the religious women took an active part in designing their clothes. Uh, the Christian nuns, as you said, accepted the clergy uh, traditional code of dress. And therefore to me, they served uh, only a source of uh, inspiration uh, for the for the first two groups. Uh, could we see the, the the slide of the Benedictine nuns? Um, um, which number slide is that, please? It's nine, I think. Uh, no, twelve. Yeah, so first, so first of all, you can see that also nuns used to wear uh, veils while going out of the monastery, even to the garden uh, convent. Uh, it was a very familiar uh, uh, part of their costume um, uh, during, uh, let's say, till the end of the, the 19th century. But uh, of course, their lives are completely different from the other two groups. And uh, they live isolated, more or less, uh, in their convents. And But still, it, it was very amazing to see the similarities um, uh, in the small details of their, of their dress and how um, the Jewish uh, modesty women try uh, to take this um, um, sort of uh, give, uh, giving meaning to every uh, single part of their layers. So you're right, uh, the veiled uh, Jewish women are exceptional by all means. Uh, their faces are completely covered and they consider the veil as the highest uh, spiritual uh, grade uh, because if, if they are completely covered, then uh, there's, no, uh, there's no chance um, that uh, the evil forces will penetrate uh, their body. Um, so uh, they they are protected, uh, but also save the men from any kind of uh, temptation. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, it is important to note uh, that not all the women uh, of this group are veiled. Some of them uh, just covered, uh, quite heavily covered, but not veiled because it's too hard for them with so many children to, to manage with it. Or uh, as they do most of the work of the house and also the, the shopping and everything, it's hard. It's not easy to, to manipulate uh, those uh, uh, big uh, covers, what they call redid. Um, uh, but uh, all of them, um, all of them in the beginning were condemned uh, and also the Muslim in their society were scorned 
but it's it's really interesting to see that both are gaining uh, popularity. Um, the Muslim, of course, uh, they are part of uh, a global uh, phenomenon, but um, we have to we have to remember that the pilgrimage to Mecca uh, really uh, be became very extensive, and Mecca uh, became a center for exchanging uh, religious uh, Muslim dress. So even, uh, even in Israel, I can see uh, differences uh, between areas. Like in the North, uh, the Muslim will cover themselves in certain way. Uh, in the center, for instance, in uh, Baqa al Harabiya, they designed um, a very special cape that doesn't exist in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, you can see uh, women who brought things from Egypt or Yemen. And we have to remember that uh, a lot of garments are um, ordered in the internet from Turkey or from Iran. So the variety is much bigger than among the Jewish um, veiled women, uh, but they have less layers, I would say. Um, and let's say uh, the last cry was not heard yet. Thank you very much, Noam, for this uh, really, really fascinating uh, stories. Uh, we have a few really interesting questions from the audience. So uh, I would like to, uh, to read them um, just in the, in the order of appearance. So maybe we will uh, give it a little bit more time because uh, it seems that people are really engaged. So let me start with the first question, uh, which I think uh, was really uh, uh, an important question and probably many people were concerned with the same thought. So it's a question from Elaine Frankowski, who says at least one of the women mentioned modesty as a service to men, so as not to lead them to look upon women with lust. Why should mm -hmm. women use their clothes to protect men? <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's a hard question. But um, in the Jewish tradition, I would say, um, the, um, the scene of Eve is uh, there is all the responsibility of Eve sin is on the women. Women are daughters of Eve. Uh, so, as to repent this sin, um, Jewish men should learn Torah from dawn to, to night, and, uh, and the women should, um, should be modest, because modesty will save uh, the uh, the people of Israel. Modesty is the way to redemption. Um, you know that uh, whenever the there is a catastrophe, um, um, you you can you can see in in the streets of Measharim, the ultra orthodox neighborhood, pamphlets or pashkvils, what we call that uh, calling the women to be more modest because everything bad that happens, it's because of lack of modesty. So even in nowadays, in Corona times, there are pashkvils in Mea that uh, call the women to be more modest.
And in that sense, we recently had a lovely discussion, which actually mentioned the fact that we are all now wear masks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, so in some way, we are participating in a sense in that, <laughs> <laughs> in that effort, which is, which is a really interesting situation. And maybe we will leave really the last couple of minutes to show uh, uh, really lovely images that Noam provided of uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, women from the free monotheistic religion also wearing uh, medical masks. So, mm -hmm. but it really is uh, such an interesting uh, time now to, to sort of try and, uh, uh, and compare the different uh, reactions, right? And the kind of different experiences that we all share about face and face covering. So, <laughs> right. So I would like to go to the next question. Uh, a question from Arthur, and the question is as follows. When was it men or women who invented this costume of complete cover up? Mm. Um, certainly women, which is uh, really surprising um, because uh, it, it's, uh, it's hard to it's hard for us to understand why women uh, would take such a burden on herself and cover herself in such uh, uh, layers and coverings. Um, I have to tell you that uh, among the, the Jewish uh, modest women, there's also grade of uh, covering like you have the radid, the upper cover of two meters, which is the, mod, the most uh, popular. Then you have one of six meters. And then the highest grade is of 15 meters of clothes, yeah, of fabric. Just imagine moving with this, but it, it's really fascinating to see them just going quickly because they always run away from the photographers. Photographers are in love with those women because this is really a drama, a dramatic uh, view. Uh, so they, 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 uh, they go upstairs and, and moving so quickly um, with uh, this heavy uh, uh, cover. And uh, uh, I, I, I have to say that uh, one of the, the nuns, the, the Russian Orthodox nun, um, complained to me, it's so uncomfortable. It was, it was designed by men. But the Jewish women uh, designed this uh, costume by themselves, and they and they uh, relate to it as as feminism, because they invented something completely new, something that goes back uh, to the matriarchs, to Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah. They 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 are sure that they were dressed like this. And this is why they say, but this is the truth. This is the, the genuine uh, dress of a modest woman. Thank you very much, Noam. Uh, let us uh, move to the next question. Right, so that, that is a really interesting uh, question as well from Urba. Uh, how much of woman dress is response to underlying harassment of women by men, chauvinistic behavior in the Holy Land? Is this a male societal behavior response? And then there is a thank you for sharing those stories. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I, I am the one to answer on such question, yes, yes, of course, there is harassment of uh, of women. Women uh, 
get killed by the husbands. Uh, there's a lot of violence towards women, uh, sure. And of course, uh, this kind of dress um, uh, has a protective mean, uh, protective quality. Um, like the like the Muslim said. Uh, now I feel protected because I don't want those whistles and those uh, uh, gazes and uh, you know small uh, shouting at me or things like this when I'm walking in the street. Now all respect me. So there is there is uh, something that relate to to the violence of men. I think that I can also add maybe in the from the perspective of, of our script writing, like our script, that uh, we did make a decision there because we felt that it wasn't something uh, major that we heard. I mean, we did hear some, some of them mentioning, yes, like I feel that I have uh, uh, sinned or saw things that I shouldn't have seen or have experienced things. And this is my way to repent or to um, get away from that. But but we but it was quite anecdotal. Like it wasn't it wasn't major. The men, most of them did did express this more feminist approach, feministic approach of saying, like they say in the film, I want to put my borders. I want me to have the decision who gets to see me, who gets to touch me, who gets to visit my private um, sphere space uh, so it was a more yeah we f we did genuinely uh, hear more of that mm -hmm. right uh, so we I'm afraid we need to uh, to wrap up this discussion which is absolutely fascinating and of course we could continue talking and and listening to stories from Noam and and Ari and uh, uh, maybe there are quite a few other questions in the Q&A which I think are really interesting questions so maybe what I could do is I will copy the questions and I will forward them to uh, to Noam and Ari and maybe if you if you have uh, time we can uh, to just write a few words uh, back to uh, to people and we will try to sort of share it uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I would just like to conclude with those uh, three last images, right, Noam, from, from your uh, presentation. So Genevieve, if you can please show the last three images with masks. Yes, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, the next. And the next. Right. <laughs> so thank you very much for our wonderful panel and thank you very much for everyone who attended and thank you very much for your thoughtful questions. Uh, yes, so I would like to pass it back to Robin event to conclude the event. Great, thank you so much Katya and Ari, Noam, Shir, and Noam for such a thought provoking and in-depth conversation surrounding this film and perhaps taking a look yeah. at our own personal veils and how they inform our perspectives on ourselves and others. Thank you all for being a part of this event today. Today is the last day of the Twin Cities Jewish Film Festival. We hope you have enjoyed many of this year's film offerings. Many of the films are still available to watch throughout the day 
So please continue to enjoy the festival and thank you all again to our panelists, our community partners, and to all of you for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening. Thank you. Thank you all thank you very much. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you, everybody. And feel free to revisit the film on Vimeo because it's open there. And if you want to share it, then you can. <laughs> yes, and the exhibition is still on, right, Noam? Uh, Noam, we can't hear you. Just a moment. Yes, it is still on. Um, now, now it's covered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, because the museum is closed, but it will be unveiled after the corona. <laughs> um, can, can we also, if we want the catalog, can people order the catalog from the museum website? Sure. Okay. Sure. Right. So if you happen to be in Israel and there is no lockdown, mm -hmm. come and see the show and it's, it's a really, really interesting uh, visit. Right, thank you very much to everyone.